Okay, I'll start then. Uh, first of all, okay, I would like to send. Uh, I would like to thank the journal for inviting me to give this particular talk, especially in memory of uh, Benoit Godin, because I've been influenced by his work a lot. Okay, and I think he's one of the pioneer in critical innovation studies. So it is my real honor, okay, to be able to be invited, okay, to give this lecture. Uh, my lecture today is uh, with a slightly long title, I'm afraid, because it really sums up what I want to say, okay? And that is from panoptic knowledge brand on competitiveness to synoptic knowledge platform of innovation imaginary. And my case study will be the World Economic Forum, especially in relation to the fourth industrial revolution. So let me start. My talk is divided into four parts. First of all, as uh, you know, the, uh, the introduction has said that you know, I work on cultural political economy, and uh, I would like to share with you our take on cultural political economy and the possibility of using it in critical innovation study. That's the first part. The second part is I'll illustrate, okay, with, well, with the aid of an example, okay, especially on the discourse of competitiveness. And in the past, in my 2009 article, I have argued that, okay, the, the development of competitiveness discourse has gone through three stages or three overlapping stages. And became an article and came up with a fourth stage. And this is why, okay, I deliberately highlight the fourth stage as the main presentation for today. And this is why I'm going to go very quickly on the first three stages because I've already written on it and I'm sure it's over old ground too much. But just to set the scene, okay, to set the story in action. So I'm going to present that bit again very quickly. But my emerging stage four, where I would argue that nodal discourse, and not only a nodal discourse, this nodal discourse even mediate the World Economic Forum to become a global knowledge platform. But the question is, it's not just simply enough to describe it as a global knowledge platform. It's how do you analyze it from a critical viewpoint? And here, I would like to introduce another Foucauldian idea, not just the panopticon, but the synopticon, the synoptic platformization of World Economic Forum. And then I will end with some concluding remarks. So first part, how to political economy, economy. It can be applied to lots of related areas, ranging from critical innovation study, critical geography, critical media study. Okay, And of course, we ourselves run cultural political economy conferences as well. And then we've got people coming from all sorts of background, but commonly interested in critical study. So as I said, okay, in our book, Okay, which uh, if you're interested, just email me and I can send you a copy, uh, send you a virtual copy, of course. <laughs> just email me and I will send it. Then in this uh, particular book, okay, of course we suggest a number of ways, okay, of there are many, many entry points in the study of cultural political economy. But among the many ways, one of them is the study of the reproduction of hegemony. In other words, it's not just simply studying hegemony in a Gramscian sense, but the reproduction and the production of hegemony in the remaking of social relations that, re that are mediated by economic imaginary and discourses. And discourses such as competitiveness, such as the fourth industrial revolution. Okay, these are major discourses that we need to look at. So, as I said, there are many entry points, okay, interested in hegemony and discourse. Now, given that we're interested in those two aspects, of course, the work of Gramsci and Foucault has to come in. So, in other words, of course, we all know that, okay, Gramsci and Foucault, okay, there are tension, okay, between their work and there are also resonance. I'm not saying that there's only resonance and there's only tension, okay? There are 
tension and at the same time resonance, okay, in their work. And then how to political economy, CPE, which we call it, okay, seek to interweave them. Interweave them, she we focus on hegemony, language, and domination, especially the dialectically related processes in the production of hegemony. So hegemony here is being seen as processes. We are more interested, not just the hegemony as such, but the hegemonization processes. And of course, given that we're interested in the hegemonization processes, how does it get into subjectivity? Okay, how does it get into consciousness? Okay, and this is when Foucault comes in. So from Foucault, we focus on the discourse, discipline, and governmentality. And Foucault's work obviously deal with the how question, the how question of how subjectivities and identity are constituted. And of course, the microphysics of disciplinary and governmental power that are, in, that are involved in the making of subjectivities. So, of course, our work okay, in cultural political economy has tried to intervene, interweave Foucault and Gramsci. And here, I just want to introduce a term which we call Foucauldized Gramsci. In other words, it's not just simply Gramsci alone or, or, or Foucault alone, but Foucauldizing Gramsci. How do we seek to Foucauldize Gramsci? We seek to Foucauldize Gramsci by deepening Gramsci's hegemonic processes through Foucault's microdisciplinary and governmental power to shed more light on the changing cartography of hegemony making. In other words, it's the cartography, not just simply there's hegemony, but what does this hegemony make doubt of? Okay, what's the cartography? And later on, I hope in my example to illustrate some aspect of this cartography. Not only that, but at the same time, try to locate Foucault's technology of disciplinary and discursive power in the remaking of hegemony that acts through constructed objects. Okay, later on, I hope to illustrate the constructed innovation object in fourth industrial revolution. Okay, the events, the events that are hosted, okay, by the World Economic Forum. Uh, <laughs> the events that are hosted by the World Economic Forum and the stagecraft, the stagecraft of Guru, okay, the stagecraft of, okay, you know, the consultancy, okay, the CEO attending World Economic Forum, okay, kind of social forces. So we obviously try to apply this approach and we try to approach we try to apply this approach to understand the discourse of competitiveness and the changing nature of capitalist social relation. So, of course, then I need a case to illustrate. Okay, what do we mean? Okay, how do you do it? All right, it's easily said and done. Okay, but the question is, okay, how do you do it? So here I pick on, okay, a number of years ago, okay, the development of competitiveness discourse. Okay, how does this discourse become so hegemonic? Okay, you know, it's in, it's, it's in, City government, okay, it is in World Economic Forum, regional government, even university. Okay, they're talking about competitiveness index of university. So the three overlapping stages in the development of competitiveness discourses. Well, competitive discourses has gone through three overlapping stages. The first one, theoretical paradigm. The second stage, policy paradigm. And the third stage is management consultancy knowledge, not only knowledge, but that knowledge has even become a knowledge brand, okay? I quickly go into these three stages, but as I've said, uh, when I started off the talk, my focus is mainly on the emerging stage four. So the three stages, stage one. Stage one, theoretical paradigm. Competitive discourse is a very long history, of course but we trace it from the development since, okay, the 1960s. Well, of course, this body of knowledge draw on Schumpeter's work, especially his idea of economic theory on creative destruction and innovation, virtue of entrepreneurial competition, tendency for innovation to cluster, okay, all those typical Schumpeterian ideas. This Schumpeterian ideas by the 60s has already built on, okay, 
by the 60s, okay, building on this Schumpeterian idea of, okay, you know, innovation, et cetera, et cetera, okay, we begin, sorry, no, by the 60s, built on this, okay, body of work, okay, already developed, okay, into, if you like, a multidisciplinary area of study. Okay, under the leadership of Spru, okay, Friedman, okay, Chris Freeman's work, applying it to science and technology, seeing science and technology of engine for economic growth and development, technological competition become a driving force for economic development and international or national competitiveness. Fackenberg's, you know, work, okay, the whole Spru project, et cetera, et cetera. That was, if you like, okay, the embryonic stage of uh, this kind of competitiveness innovation interface kind of discourse as a theoretical paradigm. But it's gone on from a theoretical paradigm to a policy paradigm, okay, especially in the 80s. In the 80s, given the economic downturn, okay, in the US and UK, as a result of rising Japan, of, and of course nowadays China, but then it was Japan, newly industrializing country in East Asia. Okay, then this theoretical paradigm took on a policy turn. A policy turn, as you can see it from Reagan administration, okay, from OECD paper, from EU paper, all sorts of, okay, competitiveness council, et cetera, et cetera, all ride on the narration of loss of competitiveness, okay, and the argument for the need for competitiveness Policy. In other words, stage two, where theoretical paradigm turned into okay, a policy paradigm, okay, and picked up by lots and lots of different administrations around the world. Then, okay, I will cut the long story short, okay, as I said, my focus is on stage four. Then the next one is stage three. Not to simply talk about the loss of competitiveness, but how do you get it right? Okay, how do you get it right? And you begin to see, okay, you know, in management and business school, okay, people start to write on this area, especially business school professors such as Porter, okay, Harvard Business School, Porter's famous book, The Competitive Advantage of the World, okay, you know, his, sorry, The Competitive Advantage of Nation, okay, his best selling book, all right. Diamond model, okay, cluster, okay, as being, if you like, the cluster template become popular, very, very popular among the policy consultancy think tank world. And even, okay, Porter's diamond, okay, he's suggesting how do you cluster, okay, the reinvention of his cluster paradigm, okay, you know, some is even regarded as industry standard, okay, in regional and local government. Right, and what happened is okay, but of course, it's not without debate, of course, it's not without criticism. But nonetheless, okay, this whole, if you like, Porter Diamond, etc., etc., plus the building, okay, gradually acquire brand status in the consultancy policy world. Okay, due to what? Due to maybe the cliche of Harvard Business School, it's gen generality, okay, because what. Because diamond model is a very simple model, okay? You know, a few boxes, okay? You draw a few arrows around them, make it double diamond, make it triple diamond, okay, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very general, it's very simple and quite flexible as a model, which can be recontextualized. In other words, it's very user-friendly, okay? Not only it is user-friendly, it even offer ready policy advice, okay? Do cluster, cluster strategy, via high profile conferences, okay, business media, talk show, all right, you know, Harvard, Harvard Business School Journal, et cetera, et cetera, okay, in and among the guru, okay, consultancy industry, okay, such as the Monitor Group. But this sort of, you know, clustering, okay, or coming together of, if you like, okay, you know, group of people centered around some business school, et cetera, et cetera, is also promoted by a range of institutions. Okay, the World Economic Forum, UNIDO, United Nations, okay, Industry Development Organization, Regional Development Think Bank, National and City Government, more or less, they all more or less got, okay, a competitiveness strategy of one kind or another. How do you do cluster? How do you build things that are similar to Silicon Valley, et cetera, et cetera? So competitiveness, okay, gradually gaining a brand status. Okay, in the guru consultancy think tank world. 
And like commercial bank, okay, knowledge bank is a bit like commercial banks. Okay, knowledge brands address the rational and irrational aspect of human nature. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> address the rational and irrational aspect of human nature. It appealed to the rational side of policy solution, but at the same time, it appealed to the fear, the fear of loss of competitiveness and the desire of economic and economic growth, economic restructure and economic growth. So here I argue that, okay, competitiveness of the Harvard style, okay, you know, decent if you like, building, building of, uh, of, of, of cluster, okay, et cetera, et cetera, okay, has gradually become a knowledge brand. A knowledge brand can be defined as a resonant hegemonic, okay, means, uh, uh, make, uh, as, as a meaning-making device promoted by world-class guru academic consultant who claim unique knowledge of the economic and innovation world. They pragmatically translate this into transnational policy recipe and even toolkit. Okay, later on, I'm going to talk about index as being one of the toolkit. So, and toolkit that address social tension, contradiction, and dynamic that also appeal to the pride, threat, and anxiety about social economic restructuring. So this body of knowledge as a knowledge brand comes with, okay, is comes with, okay, its own toolkit and even knowledge apparatus. On regional level, this includes the use of metaphor, the metaphor of chain, the metaphor of cluster, okay, that are turned into cluster brand training courses, even menu, okay, development menu in promoting competitiveness or development. On international level, institutions such as World Economic Forum even construct their own toolkit. This toolkit includes benchmarking, okay, annual report, okay, the so-called World Economic Forum annual report. This annual report comes with scorecards, comes with indexes. Due to the lack of time, okay, I just quickly use index as an illustration of the power dimension, the critical dimension of this body of knowledge. Okay, so index. Well, the index, okay, as I said, all right, you know, they come with, okay, you know, lots and lots of numbers, okay. It, what index are their numbers? But index from a Foucauldian viewpoint, if you look at Global Competitiveness Index is a measurement evaluative instrument. Evaluating what? Evaluating country. How far? Are you number one or number two? Okay, if you're number one, okay, and drop to number five, aha, okay, what are you going to do, okay, in the next round? So, so here, if one uses a Foucauldian viewpoint to look at, okay, those indexes, okay, we can interpret it as a panoptic tick number order, okay? This panoptic number order, like Foucauldian way of seeing, okay, panopticon, this panoptic gaze, very similar, okay, to a prison warden gaze, okay, original Foucauldian's work about, okay, this prison gaze, they watch over prisoner, and as a result of the prisoner know that they are being watched, they change their behavior. So it's a power of mind over mind. Okay, and of course here we are not talking about, okay, the prison warden. We're talking about the number order watching us. Okay, watching us a bit like that, okay, picture there. Okay, the number order watching us. And in this case, the number order watches and rank country in terms of their competitiveness, strengths, and weaknesses. And country are then compared, judged in terms of the economic performance with each other. It, the other side, okay, of the of the slide you can see, okay, is a typical, okay, index, a competitiveness index, okay, this year or last year, 2019, okay, you know, Singapore first, okay, you know, United States, Hong Kong, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, okay, so this index operates as a paper panopticon. Of course, it's not a prison warden actually having a pair of eye and zoom in. Of course, not that. 
but it's more like a paper panopticon, ranking country, okay, on this hierarchy. So the index operates as a paper panopticon with disciplinary capacity of the index over country via the discursive technology of ranking and hierarchicalization. And this technology of ranking and hierarchicalization is a disciplinary apparatus that involve the few watching the many. The few this time is not the few people. This time it's a paper panopticon watching over the many country, the many city. Okay, if you talk about university in their competitive index, it's watching over the universities, okay, on the hierarchy and discipline and discipline the behavior of policymaker, okay? Okay, what do we do now? Now we've fallen in our competitiveness index. So discipline in a way, okay, the policymaker, planner or city administrator or our own university administrator, our vice chancellor. Many, <laughs> many, many meetings are being set up just to rescue our <laughs> competitiveness index. But nonetheless, Okay, so, but if you like, it's stage three. Now I'm really going into, okay, what I'm supposed to do today. And that is, what is the emerging stage four? Okay, the stage four, this is not in my paper, and it is an update from my paper. Okay, and here I'm arguing, and that is now what we are experiencing is not just simply a panoptic aspect of this competitiveness knowledge brand. Now it is working in parallel with a synoptic one, okay? And I will explain, okay, New Foucauldian's work on synopticon in addition to panopticon, okay? Often they both work together, okay? So just bear with me. Not only in this stage four, I would like try to introduce the idea of synopticon, but at the same time, this knowledge brand of competitiveness now has become a nodal discourse, okay? And I will explain what is a nodal discourse as I move along. And this nodal discourse, okay, mediate the World Economic Forum to become the global knowledge platform for the new innovation imaginary, such as those related to the fourth industrial revolution. So let me start with nodal discourse. Well, the stage four, okay, the first aspect is competitiveness now is not just a brand. It is a nodal discourse. A nodal discourse, okay, in people who study critical discourse analysis, such as Norman Fairclough, okay, nodal discourse are those discourses in which other discourses cluster around it to create new meaning, especially in international planning. Okay, and of course, World Economic Forum is doing a lot of international planning. So it's where other discourse, it is a mother discourse in, in a way, okay, a nodal, but other discourse cluster and work up around it. So during this so-called, okay, fourth industrial revolution, okay, a very important figure, okay, in working up this discourse is Klaus Schwartz. Okay, from the World Economic Forum. And of course, he's the founder and executive chairman of World Economic Forum. And he worked up this discourse since 2015. He even served up, okay, as the father of fourth industrial revolution. And I'm afraid you can't see him and the book because we got this uh, sort of uh, a panel there of people's faces, including myself. But anyway, so he served up as being father of fourth industrial revolution, even claimed to coin the term, okay, fourth industrial revolution on the World Economic Forum website and published the first book on fourth industrial revolution, sold one million copy and translated into 26 languages. Carl Schwartz, okay, is not only, okay, the chairman of W. Oh, sorry, uh, Chairman of World Economic Forum, okay, he at the same time, okay, on this fourth industrial revolution, work with, okay, McKenzie, okay, the consultancy firm, McKenzie and Company. Together, 
they work up the competitive discourse by linking competitiveness with, okay, the new discourses imaginary, okay, new innovation imaginary of the fourth industrial revolution. And this, for, and this innovation imaginary, okay, see the fourth industrial revolution as a new 21st century epoch where the digital, physical, and the biological innovation converge. Not only they converge, they converge, okay, to create a new, a wider set of innovation objects. These objects, okay, to quote from his book, artificial intelligence, robot, internet of things, autonomous vehicle, 3D printing, nanotechnology, excuse me, nanotechnology, biotech, material science, and, sorry, mater material science, energy storage, and quantum computing. Of course, this list goes on, okay? And these objects, not only they are, okay, being seen as innovation objects, but these objects are also ascribed with production meaning, ascribed with production meaning and practices, okay? And the question is, what are the different, and how, what kind of meaning do they ascribe to it, okay? And of course, then we have to look further. We have to look further, okay, and see how this innovation object, innovation imaginary, okay, are being created, given more meaning, okay, given more meaning by the time, okay, World Economic Forum picked them up, picked them up and created lots and lots of platform apparatuses. What are the platform apparatuses? Okay, the platform apparatuses, okay, of the World Economic Forum are platform event. Later on, I'll give you a list of example. Books, later on, the example will come, but let me just set up the shop. So this include platform events, policy book or report, networks, and even stagecraft. Okay, so let me just quickly give you a few examples. Platform event, okay? 2016, okay, World Economic Forum in Davos, the annual high profile meeting, okay? They named that meeting as Mastering the Fourth Industrial Revolution. So the discourse is already out there, high profile as being, okay, the theme of that year. Not only, okay, that theme, but at the same time, it was at the same time accompanied by books and reports. Pre-meeting book, Carl Swatch's own book, okay, the 2016, the one cell million copy in 26 languages. That was a pre-meeting book, followed by a post-meeting book, okay, which is the fourth industrial revolution, a Davos reader. And of course, I cannot, I don't think I've got the time to go into all this detail, okay, but 2017, 18 different report, okay, you know, different, okay, technology report, et cetera, et cetera. So the apparatuses is not just simply naming events as fourth industrial revolution, pre-conference book, post-conference book, followed by a whole set of reports, but at the same time, cooperating between World Economic Forum and McKinsey. Cooperating with, okay, between World Economic Forum and McKinsey. Okay, the two report, which I'm going to talk about more in much greater detail because they are crucial. They are crucial in mapping the meaning, okay? Which therefore, this is why I have Okay, put them in red. Okay, those two I will go in in greater detail. So, as I said here, so come with okay, a whole host of event, policy, book, network, stagecraft, which I will talk about later on. Okay, cooperate with McKinsey, work up the competitiveness discourse, and turning World Economic Forum into a global knowledge platform. A platform that will have, okay, mapped by all these, if you like, okay, apparatuses. And as I said earlier, I will concentrate on those two or three in red. The first two, 
those two that are, okay, collaborated with McKenzie. Okay, the two report. Well, McKenzie collaborated with World Economic Forum. Okay, in those two reports has created two contrasting company types. Okay, this is crucial. Okay, and I will try to explain. Creating two reports, but those two reports is actually trying to create or map companies in the world. Okay, because this is a world planning organization. Okay, map them in two types. The first report, okay, digital manufacturing, escaping from pilot purgatory. Okay, later on, I will explain this metaphor, okay, in detail. But anyway, just share with me, all right, you know, the, the new vocabulary in creating innovation difference. One type is very successful. The other one is not very successful in two different reports. This report, okay, created one that is called pilot purgatory, okay, where they map, that's where most companies are in terms of digital technology. This is where 84% of the company are struggling with the internet of things. In other words, they're not up to scratch, okay, in terms of the use of digital technology, okay? And they, they, if they want to escape from this purgatory, okay, halfway between heaven and halfway between heaven and, 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 and the other world, all right, then, okay, this is the way to do it. Okay, so pi, sorry, pilot purgatory, which is a, a new kind of discourse, a new kind of company being created. Okay, and if they want to escape from this, then they better scale up. Okay, so this is one type of company. Another type of company is in another report. Again, collaborated with McKenzie. And this one, okay, is called White Paper on the Fourth Industrial Revolution, Beacon, ooh, Beacon Lighthouse, okay, Beacon Technology and Innovation in Manufacturing. In fact, in the report itself, some factories are even being called Lighthouse Manufacturing Site, Lighthouse Factory. So what have you got? Okay, you're constructing, all right, two kind of company with an innovation difference, okay? The constructing of innovation difference. This construction of innovation difference, okay, first of all, as I said earlier on, trying to introduce the term, pilot perpetry. This perpetry discourse, okay, not the word perpetry, okay? It is a biblical metaphor. It comes from the Bible, okay, of waiting in the waiting room, so to say, in the waiting room, waiting to be purified before you enter heaven, okay? So this sort of purgatory, okay, the state of company, okay, 84% of them, all right, this symbolized most of the world's manufacturing company, 85% worth of them are falling behind and stuck in the waiting room to the fourth industrial revolution heaven. All right, and of course you've got this, okay, purgatory, okay, which you can't see my picture. I, my picture is a picture of people in hell, okay, trying to reach out to the heaven. But anyway, okay, so purgatory vis-a-vis -vis what? Vis-a-vis -vis a discursive other. The discursive other is a lighthouse. It's a lighthouse, lighthouse beacon, okay, shining and all that. Okay, so the lighthouse, the lighthouse factory, the lighthouse manufacturing site. They signify the competitive factory. They are the okay, model. And they benchmark okay, as model of the fourth industrial revolution. The lighthouse metaphor. Okay, two different metaphors. Construct this factory as beacon, okay, that of course guide you out of storm. Okay, it's in the original paper. Okay, this is a quotation. A beacon that guides you that guide us through the storm into stronger and more resilient future. So who are the lighthouses then, okay? Now I'm not going to read out all these details for you, I'm sorry, okay? Just quickly 
it answered them and then I move on. Okay, the, the, the 69 lighthouse, those are in heaven, okay, you know, from Bosch, okay, you know, some in Asia, some in Europe, the Hankel, the Johnson and Johnson, Potter and Gamble, Simon, etc., etc. These are the lighthouses, okay, and the lighthouses will act as, if you like, okay, beacon to guide you out, okay, to guide you out, okay, and as I said, Look, the metaphorical contrast, this dividing practices, if you use a Foucauldian term, produce an innovation gap between companies. And according to Mackenzie, this can be bridged by scaling up the digital technology to gain competitive advantage, resilient and sustainable growth. Okay? And not only that, not only constructing the two categories, even calling some of their events okay, as being lighthouse events, okay, lighthouse events, okay, so lighthouse events, okay, so some world economic events are even called lighthouse live events, okay, you know, it's just some, an example, lighthouse live events, you've got a guru speaking, okay, and who are the gurus, okay, you know, that are being involved, some of the gurus speaker in this lighthouse fire chat show, fireside chat, okay, it's how warming, okay, how cozy, all right, so in other words, okay, you know, the, the CEO, okay, of Johnson and Johnson, Ericsson, Hanko, okay, I don't, I can't, you know, go, I haven't got the time to go through the, all these, okay, but if you're interested, I can always send you the PowerPoint, okay, so this speaker going into this Lighthouse events, okay, live, and if it is not live, you can always go back and watch it online, okay, watch it on the platform, the WEF platform. Okay, the platform with all the video, all the, if you like, reports, okay, all the stage graph, okay, et cetera, et cetera. So the metaphorical contrast, okay, the live event, okay, and of course, hosted, okay, and starred by, all right, the top ranking, okay, you know, CEO of the 69 companies. So this contrasting category of pilot purgatory and the lighthouses, okay, and these sort of, if you like, okay, contrasting category are communicated, okay, communicated via report and platform event, which I have shown earlier, these kind of platform events, okay, and, all right, but the question is, Okay, this way of doing it is far from being power neutral. It's not that there's no power, you just, you know, sort of give an event. Okay, as I said, from a new Foucauldian viewpoint, okay, such platformization of WEF, okay, World Economic Forum and McKenzie Knowledge to the world audience at another micro power dimension. And this time, the micro power dimension is the synoptic power. Now, what is the synoptic power now? What is the synoptic power? Well, synoptic power is what is a synopticon as opposed to, okay, panopticon. A synopticon is medicine, okay, has reworked Foucault's work, especially his idea of panopticon and extended it to the synopticon, especially in relation to the media and social media age. In other words, Panopticon is the field watching the many, the warden watching the many inmates out there. Synopticon is the reverse. The reverse is, okay, the many watching the field. The many watching the field, especially, as I said, in the social media age. Okay, so typical dictionary definition of synoptic is taking the same or common viewpoint. Okay, so let us try to apply this concept to this case now. Madison's original formulation, of course, is focused on the media. Okay, he doesn't work on critical media study. Okay, but he focused on the media. And he tried to, okay, you know, come up with an idea of mapping the viewer society. Okay, we view, okay, the star, the celebrity, okay, review the celebrity, and as I said, okay, he argued that panopticon is the few watching the many, 
And now the Synopticon work in parallel, and that is the many watching the field. The many watching the field, the many watching it for collective consumption of entertainment, watching celebrity, okay, watch them and even admire them, okay, by the many spectator. And if you talk about Matheson's work, okay, or other people's working on similar area, they're talking about YouTube watching. They talk about reality TV star. They talk about people watching TikTok. Okay, you know, youngster, okay, you know, dancing and, you know, putting on makeup and, you know, okay, very soon to become mini celebrity, okay, et cetera, et cetera. So that was the original formulation. Now, let us try. Let us try to transfer medicine's synoptic on idea to the WEF, okay, to the World Economic Forum, especially when it becomes a platform with all these event reports Okay, you know, not only re report, but at the same time, okay, you know, events, okay, hosted by Lighthouse, okay, manager, CEO, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and that is, okay, this, if you like, okay, World Economic Forum becoming a knowledge platform that is watched by the menu and watching the field. Who are the many then? Okay, sorry. Not the manifest, okay? Who are the few then, okay? If we are watching the few, okay, then who are the few here? Who are the few? Although the World Economic Forum profiled itself as being a multi-stakeholder model of public and private actors, it actually exhibits, okay, certain elit elitist characteristics. Its meeting and event are rather exclusive, okay? It's based on exclusive in the invitation okay in other words you are invited to come and if you if you don't you're not invited to come then how much have you got okay you know sort of monetary capacity delegates okay from government and academia are invited on annual basis that they are invited for free but industry partner who can go to private session has to pay okay i'm sorry all right you know these uh these uh food, these, these things has uh, blocked some of my number Okay, you have to pay not $137, it's $137,000. Okay, so there's a thousand there. Okay, so you have to pay $137,000. Okay, and if you want to bring a guest along, you have to pay another sum. Okay, 600, sorry, 263,000 if you want to bring somebody with you to the forum. Ordinary member would cost 52,000 to join. Okay, and each ticket, Okay, will be US dollar 19,000, okay, et cetera, et cetera. So, in other words, okay, it is not, okay, you know, where, where anybody can go, all right, unless you're invited or you pay. So, or you pay. So, in a sense that the platform making is skewed towards post -cop pro corporate criteria with an inclusion of selected, invited, high status individuals, okay. And even it has been dubbed by Stephen Bannon, okay, the Trump's what at one point, okay, advisor, as being the Davos party, okay, World Economic Forum as being the Davos party. And who are the high status few? Who, well, you know, can you map them? Consultancy guru, okay, you know, of the statue, maybe of a porter type, in, intellectual entrepreneur, key opinion leaders. Okay, corporate CEO or manager, academic policy or cultural celebrity, royalty, top national politician, global bureaucrat, okay, et cetera. And they are either, as I said, they are member or they are invited, okay? If you're a member, then you're a pay member. So they occupy the platform, okay? You know, you look at some of the photographs, okay, some of these, okay, they, I'll show you some later on, okay? You know, they occupy the platform and co-produce and communicate innovation imaginary to the, to the many. In other words, these few people is communicating, okay? You know, this innovation, okay, imaginary, okay, to the many, the many, the audience out there, the audience out there who watch, okay, the platform. Okay, you know, at your own time, it can be live, okay, it can be whatever, okay, but, all right, you know, communicate, okay, via, via this platform to the many. And this, okay, for the industrial 
revolution body of innovation knowledge is communicated, communicated via the World Economic Platform annual meeting and panel discussion, and okay, the fanfare of Snow Cap Mountain meeting in Davos, okay, you know, like days, okay, you know, dinner, all right, you know, fanfare, all right, you know, flags, okay, you know, et cetera, et cetera, okay, you know, high, high profile people talking to each other, okay, and then Mari celebrity being there, okay, sitting down and listening to you, okay, and of course, so celebrity, they are well known for their performance, okay, you know, jumping up and down, okay, the Steve job of this world, okay, et cetera, et cetera, so this, Stagecraft of it as well. So, apart from the annual meeting, there are there, there are and there is an ensemble of specialized network, the network of okay, you know, lighthouse event, okay, live CEO platform, chat so shows, reporting, messaging, okay, that are visible and performative in nature. Okay, like watching shows, okay, but these shows are, of course, okay, hosted by, okay, academic, com guru, okay, CEO, et cetera, et cetera. And this area of event and program are staged by a high status view and watched by many knowledge consumer on site or well, worldwide off site. So the question is, Okay, so there are the few. And who are the many? Okay, who are the watchers then? Who are the many and knowledge consumer at different sites and scale? Corporate manager, businessman, investor, planner, strategist, lobbyist, politician, journalist, educator, okay, policy advisor, NGO think tank, social critic, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. These watcher watched relationship, that relationship between okay, the few, okay watching, or rather many watching the field, the watcher watched relationship, echo medicine's idea of synopticon, where the many watchers tune themselves into the array of false industrial revolution discourses and practices available on the world economic platform. This platformization of the World Economic Forum operate a kind of latent surveillance, a disciplined consciousness by managing the information and norms that watchers consume. In other words, they give you specific pre-selected choice that knowledge. So managing the information and norm that watchers consume, disciplining via watchers' own participation and observation, okay, you know, on screen, okay, or being there and admire, normalizing the new, okay, fourth industrial revolution innovation imaginary as desire of the many by the seduction of spectacle. In other words, the technology, the Foucauldian technology here is the seduction of spectacle related to celebrity guru stagecraft, snow-capped mountain, okay, of the World Economic Forum, dishing out, okay, you know, all these techno norm based okay, you know, discourse such as purgatory, okay, pilot purgatory, okay, or, okay, lighthouses, lighthouses CEO, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and of course, it's dishing out not just simply a spectacle, but hope. Okay, hope. Hope to improve, hope to leave the purgatory to become heavenly lighthouses. So, such technology of spectacle and seduction operate to self steer watchers to follow and modify themselves to become innovation subject of the fourth industrial revolution. They interiorize this technonome and synoptic control, which thus take the form of exercise of free will, okay, in a negative sense, of course, and even common sense. Watchers then flexibly translate. After watching, it doesn't mean that you have to take everything, everything they said, of course not, okay, but Watchers flexibly translate 
translate and combine this emergent technopole into their own agenda, okay? Whatever suits, whatever you selected from it, okay? Into their own agenda in the making of the fourth industrial revolution social relation, such as, okay, translated into your own agenda, such as pursuing possible rewards, such as higher ranking score for your company on the performance indicator, New partnership, okay, you know, suggesting that I could do this, do that, okay, in order to, okay, form new partnership, in order to get grants, in order to get this and that, personal advancement, promotion, alternative report, if you're slightly on the critical side, okay, you use that to write your alternative report. So, in this regard, these synoptic processes operate subtle form of power that discipline the watchers by simultaneously controlling, controlling, controlling by modulation, but at the same time empowering, as if empowering, but at the same time controlling. Okay, so simultaneously controlling by modulation and empowering by flexible imitation. It's not just 100% imitation, but flexibly okay, imitating. You translate it in the way that suits your agenda into their policy work lives. This kind of platform mediated synoptic control render watchers as partners in prudence in building consensus. And this consensus is not without negotiation, the Gramsci. Okay? Hegemony is always negotiated. Hegemony is not domination, it's always negotiated. So render them, render the watchers as partners in prudence, in building consensus, but not without negotiation. From a new Gramscian perspective, the World Economic Forum can be seen as a consensus broker. This consensus broker mediate the working up of competitive knowledge brand towards digital capitalism and modify consciousness to make its common sense. Contribute towards the constitution of individual and collective subjectivity that congeal around the fourth industrial okay, revolution norm in the process of consensus building, but not without negotiation. So by full codizing Gramsci, back to the beginning of my lecture now, by, by full codizing Gramsci, we can deepen our understanding of the cartography of hegemony. Remember when I started it, I said, it's not just hegemony. We try to open up it as a cartography. The cartography of hegemony via further understanding of the subjectivization processes. From hegemony, okay, we can see, or from hegemony, hegemony is partly produced through a synoptic, spectacularized discursive formation of hope, the hope of going to become a lighthouse, heaven. A redirection of consciousness towards the making of innovation subject acquiescence in preferred norms. Routinized behavior of flexible imitation, okay, you're not going to take everything on block, okay, it's flexible imitation, sometimes even part rejection. Pursuance of possible reward and criticisms. This does not mean that the World Economic Forum does not face counter-hegemonic challenges, okay, from parallel forum and beyond its role and practices as consensus broker can continuously co-op, contain, and reinvent competitive norm in the unstable equilibrium of compromise between social forces at different sites and scale. If I just got another few minutes, I will just quickly conclude, if I may. Let me quickly conclude. We try to okay, share with you, uh, both myself and Bob Jessup. In fact, Bob Jessup is sitting right opposite me. Okay, you know, if he wants to come and say hello later on. But anyway, we want to share with you a cultural political economy approach 
that inter that interweave, okay, the new Foucauldian and new Gramscian perspective in critical innovation study. Using the case of the development of competitiveness discourse, we try to discuss four stages. We especially try to concentrate on stage four and seek to Foucault diagramshi and illustrate how you Foucault diagramshi. And this helped to shed light on the recontextualization of the competitiveness knowledge brand and the development of a synoptic and panoptic power. The panoptic power of competitiveness index, the competitiveness rhetoric as nodal discourse, where other discourse are work up, okay, to become part of this competitiveness discourse mediated by the World Economic Forum and the World Economic Forum in a viewer world, in a media world, okay, when it becomes a platform, okay, you know, for innovation watchers, okay, then it becomes in a way, okay, a global synoptic knowledge platform. Okay, and these are the four stages. And this platformization is mediated by SWATCH discursive leadership to map innovation object of the age, okay, you know, for the many, you know, innovation watchers out there. Of course, it's not only him, all right, but at the same time, co-constructed by, okay, World Economic Forum, McKenzie, Building network, event, website, report, contrasting category of companies, stage craft, et cetera, et cetera. The visibility and seduction of his guru mediated stagecraft subjectified watchers to become innovation subject by modulating their hope and anxiety in the direction of these, of these you know, false industrial revolution imaginary. Okay, the imaginary is leave purgatory leave this rating room and become heavenly lighthouses. And from a Foucauldian viewpoint, this form of synoptic power acts through the world economic platform and redirect consciousness of the watchers towards building okay, the four IR consensus. But not without negotiation, of course. Technology of spectacle and seduction mediate the self-subjectivization of the watchers into the new social relation. This hope-based subjectivization of the fourth industrial revolution, so of the fourth industrial revolution social relation, from a new Gramscian perspective, contribute to the WEF platform becoming a consensus broker. In this regard, this paper illustrates how cultural political economy in full codizing Gramsci can be used to shed light on what? On two questions, the what question and the how question. The what question is, what are the micro and macro aspects of power in the remaking of digital capitalism in this case? The micro power of panopticon and synopticon, the macro power of the World Economic Forum acting as a consensus broker in world international planning. The how question, of course, Foucault is very good in how, but not in what or why. So the how question, how new Foucauldian micropanopticon and synoptic power can play a subjectivization role in the making and changing cartography of hegemony making and, of course, negotiation, okay, in the remaking of both industrial revolution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mugalin. Very, very inspiring conference, uh, very rich and dense also. Um, yes. <laughs> I believe uh, we have, uh, let's, let's, I would have to ask you to stop your sharing screen. Great, I can see you all. Uh, I'm sure we, we have already some commentaries here in our chat room. Um, I think it would be nice if uh, everyone could turn, turn on the cameras now uh, for us to see the faces <laughs> for a while at least. 
but well the, the <laughs> connection now seems more more stable um so it's time to raise hands if anyone has uh, some questions i have a couple of them but i would like Ooh, to i don't have the hand thing now you can you can turn turn on your mic no problem if you have a, a question to uh, for example we have half rain adrian smith but uh, half had a comment here in the in the chat please please half you that, make that, that that's just a tiny little comment uh, the concept of purgatory is not biblical it's never mentioned <laughs> in the bible uh, it's actually it's, uh, it's early medieval catholic um, catholicism uh, actually probably influenced by buddhist uh, movements across the great silk road uh, just i have a I sort of have theology as a hobby, so, so I'm, I'm kind of touchy when it comes to the concept of purgatory. That wasn't my question, though. I was very fascinated by this notion of the imaginary, particularly because it's such a complex term. I mean, obviously, uh, first come, mainly comes to stuff from Lacan, where it's part of the constitution of the ego. But these days often kind of referred to as a Deleuzean concept, which mainly kind of talks about the mirroring and uh, and uh, I believe Deleuze points out that it's always a double movement, always a mode of the double. So my question what was in the notion of an innovation imaginary, I would think of this in Lacanian sense as more, more of an ego practice or as kind of a mirroring concept in, in a broader, broader kind of social imaginary. And in that case, what is the mirroring action? What's the mirroring agent? What are we mirroring it against? I mean, you can go to the very simplistic notion that, that innovation is simply the mirror of the, the real, uh, not in Lacanian sense, uh, sort of a, a, a dream of the becoming uh, of the next world, which can be also seen as a religious notion. Uh, but I believe that if you take Davos as a specific example, the, the notion of Davos as imaginary needs to kind of, what is the double there? If one is using a Deleuzean notion of the imaginary, that is. Great answer to it, okay? And for me, already imaginary, okay, which I have worked on for other purpose, okay, for, for more a political economy, okay, a, 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 a entry point, okay, as opposed to a, 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 a sort of, if you like, psychoanalytical, you know, kind of a viewpoint. Okay, and, and, and of course, okay, you know, what I work on is imaginary, okay, the way how I see it in my work is, okay, the imaginary of hope and fear, okay, that's the one that I'm mainly focused on, okay, in that sense, and thank you for the, for the, for the feedback, okay, on that it is not, okay, biblical, okay, and I will dig a, a little bit further in that, yes, you might be right, okay, it could have a, it could have a, have a Buddhist, you know, sort of a background, okay, and uh, maybe, maybe, maybe that is, you know, uh, worth, worth digging into, or this Bob has a, has a, has a, has a, has a view on the imaginary, because, you know, we work on that as well. It's, do you do you want to come here, uh, Bob? Uh, Bob Jessup, okay, my 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 co-author, okay, with the book, okay, you know he. Hello. Yes, we're using the imaginary simply as a way of saying that one doesn't have direct access to the real world, but always one has to imagine the real world, and we're using that in the sense uh, that one finds, for example, in Althusser who refers to the necessary misrecognition of the real that is mediated through ideology. And we're arguing that since we don't have direct access to the real world, we have to simplify the reality of the real world by doing so through ideas, through imaginaries. And we're using the imaginary as a very general way to describe the ways in which individuals and social actors imagine the nature of the real world and part of cultural political economy is of course to explore the relationship between one's imaginary and the nature of the real world. So cultural political economy combines critical semiotic analysis of imaginaries with critical material analysis, the objective structures of the real world. 
but, but then in that case, it, it is actually relatively close to the Lacanian use of the term, uh, which, which is completely fine. I, I just, because then this is in a sense how Lacan, particularly the later Lacan, defines the notion of the imaginary. Okay, thank yeah, you. Thank you. Adrian maybe has another yeah, thank you, Tiago, and, and, and thanks for a, a really um, fantastic presentation and paper. I just want to pick up something at the end that you left hanging. You mentioned that, obviously, um, the Fourth Industrial Revolution is not immune to um, uh, counter-hegemonic challenges. And I wondered if you could maybe give us some examples or what you saw <laughs> might be the most counter uh, and, and then how that kind of influences 4IR, what's the response in relation to that? Thank you. Well, currently, uh, as, far as, I, as far as I know, okay, there are quite, quite a few groups, maybe, maybe off the top of my head, I can't remember their names, but it's the counter he 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 hegemonic side would be, okay, you know, the, the anti-digital, Okay, focus on privacy, focus on the, not only just privacy, but okay, you know, say for example, okay, you know, what is all this data capitalism is all about? Okay, you know, what is the value of data? You, you know what I'm saying? Okay, you know, in other words, okay, you know, do we use data to capitalize? Do you use data to create more technology in order to control us more? Okay, but off the top of my head, okay, I cannot give you uh, uh, groups, but, but, but there are plenty, not plenty, but enough of groups out there. Okay, you know the the, 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 the sort of more the sort of more more uh, kind of um, a kind of um, uh, not a hacker group, but do you see what I'm trying to say? You know, I, I hate to use the word hacker here, but 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 I'm trying just to give them a, a, a more shorthand shorthand way of saying it. Okay, and one could work up the paper to include that group. Okay, and how they see as the fourth industrial revolution, all these talk about, because currently I've been working on that myself as well, not so much of the counter hegemony, but the hegemonic side, how data capitalism is trying to assetize, okay, turn data, turn data into asset, okay, and how do they do it, and not only how do they do it, but at the same time, okay, where are the gaps, and how do you intervene into the gaps, okay, as such, and the gaps are has been okay, you know, very, very technical. And that is what kind of protocol do you use when you turn things into data and telling people that this is this is uh, this is privacy. Okay. In other words, if it is even privacy, okay, they say that okay, we 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 we, we abide to the privacy code. Yeah, but if you dig further, there are plenty of different codes out there. Do you see what I mean? Some are some are more straight than others. Okay, and once that, when once one set of data is transferred to a different site, then the code is no longer applied. <laughs> so it is, it is, it is a, a very, if you like, okay, you know, rather, uh, 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 rather technically challenging area, okay, for us to work on. But 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 I, I guess you sort of see what I'm trying to get at, okay, and that is. You know, people really, really, the, the, the alternative hackers who, who know where, what, okay, and, and which protocol, okay, to tackle. Okay, I have a question. Um, Professor, in your work, we can identify, I mean, different sources uh, within the critical thought traditions. And you, you have combined several of those traditions, which I think is remarkable. And I, I find also interesting how most of the time scholars tend to find uh, uh, differences or divergences among those authors. I, I mean, Marx, Gramsci, Foucault. Uh, uh, how do you answer uh, to those who are uh, uh, worried about uh, eclecticism, for example? It is very common in the uh, leftist milieus, for example, in, in the southern end countries like Portugal, Spain, Brazil, Argentina. Uh, uh, usually our colleagues tend to choose and pick one author and leave it aside <laughs> the yes, others. Yes, yes, you yes, can yes. give your testimony on, on that experience. Yes, yes, yes. 
Um, I'm completely with you. You know, we were in Argentina and we were in, I can't remember, Ecuador, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And then, you know, either you pick Marx or you pick, you know, I know. Um, yeah. This is exactly how, this is exactly the area we try to venture into. And that is, of course, in the, in the beginning of my talk, I did say that there are tensions and there are resonance and dissonance, okay, between their work, okay? And the question is, is if, you, if, you, if, you, if you only just look at Marx and if you just only look at Gramsci or if you look at, okay, you know, only Foucault, okay, then of course, okay, it, you know, it's, very, it's, very, it's, it's very compartmentalized in certain ways. But I tend not just simply read Foucault or Foucauldian work. I read at the same time post-Foucauldian work, if you see what I'm trying to say. Okay, there are plenty of, of those post-Foucauldian post work out there. No, of course you read the Foucauldian, not that you don't, okay? But you read, okay, at the same time the post-Foucauldian and see what kind of entry point you can find. And of course, okay, there are dissonance, okay? We're not, we're not saying that there isn't dissonance, okay? You know, but the question is, if you stop there, then it won't go further if you see what I'm trying to say. And this is why in our work, okay, we try, okay, especially in, in the book, okay, you know, chapter five, okay, we try to suggest ways, okay, how we can, okay, you know, try to venture into, okay. Uh, uh, if I may just turn to the, <coughs> I, did ex I did not expect this question, otherwise I would have that, power, that bit of PowerPoint ready. Um, we try to suggest, um, we try to, I, I don't know whether you can see it, but this is the diagram that we use, okay? And that is trying to find ways, okay, around, say, for example, Gramsci, Marx, and Foucault, okay? From Gramsci, Marx, we try to, Gramsci is a way of renewing Marxism. And from Marx and Foucault, we try to Marxian dice Foucault. And from Foucault, we try to Foucault dice Gramsci or Gramsci dicing Foucault depending on what you want to get at. And this is why I said in cultural political economy, there are many, many, many entry points. As I said, we are self-run international conference. Okay, it's only because of this year, COVID, that we did not, okay? But, uh, but, uh, but the way how we, we try to, you know, communicate with people who are interested in this approach, and that is there are many, many ways of doing it, okay? And as I said at the beginning of my talk, this particular talk, I focus on, all right, you know, Gramsci, sorry, if Foucault dies in Gramsci. And I think Bob's work is more, is more the Foucault, sorry, is more the um, Marx, Gramsci with a hint towards Marx, yes, more. Yes. Yeah. So in other words, it depends on where you want to, what you want to do and what is your research topic and try to, if you like, move beyond okay, standard kind of boundary, okay, it's through pushing some of the boundary, we might not, we might be completely wrong, okay, we might be completely wrong, but if you don't push the boundary, okay, then, all right, you know, then you cannot add value, okay, to your analysis and to the strings of your critique, and I hope by illustrating this, okay, you know, through Foucault Dyson Gramsci, in my case, I'm trying to illustrate, okay, that it's not just simply the hegemony. You don't just simply describe the hegemony. You have to open up the hegemony, open up the hegemony to the point of even looking at the subjectivization process in order to get at the cartography of it. If, if, if I'm answering your question, I'm, I'm, in other words, it's trying pushing boundary. Okay, and of course, okay, pushing boundary always is okay. Other people push back, okay, and that is what boundaries are all about, okay. But but if you don't push that boundary, okay, it will just each stay in each other's box. Not only no box is not a problem, but the issue is is then okay. What can you add to the understanding of existing concept? Okay, like Hegemon, like as I said, okay, Foucault. Okay, no, you answer all the how question, all right, but where's the why question? You answer all the, okay, what question, but where's the why question? 
end right. and no questions. I don't know whether I'm answering the question. <laughs> Very well. I'm going to read chapter five for, for sure. <laughs> Just write me an email and I'll send you the book. <laughs> Our well, colleagues, there is- I know your email anyway, so. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Uh, I believe there is a few questions more from the audience, no? Monica, please. I'm, thank you very much for your very, very brilliant presentation. Um, I have in mind several things at the same time. I was thinking in, in, in surveillance capitalism. <laughs> and, and at the same time, this is a, a very long history about um, about this concept, competitiveness. But I think that at the same time, we are living an ongoing uh, feelings uh, about uh, competitiveness, competitiveness delusion, I think. Um, I, I, my, my question is it's about all the hidden counter hegemonic mm. uh, movements, discourses, uh, such as social innovation, such as the case, um, the ongoing discourses of advances towards socio-technical transition, and the ongoing <laughs> discourses, for example, in uh, European policies about the mission oriented to the to to both development, competitiveness, and uh, what is your opinion about this? Uh, such discourses, such hidden um, movements are also part of the synoptic <laughs> part of uh, your speech. What do you think about this? Uh, and at the same time, I'm so sorry because I was completely seduced by McKinsey report. <laughs> because each week <laughs> I receive reports and uh, I observed that uh, there are a lot of both types of discourses about competitiveness, but about the growth, about um, advances to our uh, sustainability goals. I, I well, <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, <laughs> what do you think about I, this? <laughs> I see. I see your point. Okay, you know. I mean, we are all seduced. Okay, if I just mass media, social media world, okay? The question is, okay, you know, if you add a critical dimension, then, you know, you, you would start to rethink just a little bit more what's going on, okay, from my point of view, of course, okay? And, uh, and, 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 and in a certain way, you know, this is how I see, I see the value of critical innovation study from my point of view, of course, you know, and that is, okay, can we come up with something Okay, that is, we started with the critique first, okay? You, you cannot come up easily with a real alternative unless you do the critique first, okay? So that, that would be my view. So, okay, you know, so, well, then, 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 then the question is, of course, you know, you, you, then, you know, in this particular one, I try to come up with a critique. I've been working on this competitiveness you know, issue for a while now, okay? And, and then until, Tango, okay, you know, contacted me, and I thought, oh, I better go back to it, okay, and then, and then to my surprise, okay, the development of the discourse has gone on, okay, the development of the discourse has gone on from panoptic to synoptic, okay, you know, in certain, <laughs> in certain sense, so I just thought, okay, you know, uh, it's within my system that I just thought I, 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 I want to bring that out, and bring that out to share with, okay, you know, sort of colleagues, but at the same time, you know, as the other gentleman, I believe it was Adrian, am I right? Or maybe I'm wrong, um, uh, who was saying that, okay, what is the counter hegemonic here? Okay, and this is what I'm, I'm busy trying to look, at, look for as well. And this is why, okay, in my other work, okay, I'm starting to go into data capitalism, okay, with surveillance capitalism, and then within surveillance capitalism is data capitalism, okay, AI capitalism, you know, the, 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 the sort of thing, and especially into the healthcare sector. Okay, where they are, if you like commodifying, okay, healthcare data, 
okay, you know, and 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 and, and, and of course, you know, in the name of sharing data and for and for and for research and development, of course, okay, you know, we all heard of those things, but the question is, is we have really, really to look into the detail, and that is once you give up your X-ray data. Okay, you know, you said yes, okay, to the hospital or your own doctor. Okay, what happened to it next? Okay, what happened to it next? Okay, you know, who 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 get control of those data? Okay, and of course, you know, they 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 say it in the in terms of okay, you know, we are going to turn it into research and development and help humanity in developing new drugs and you know, new 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 way, new this and that. Okay, but the question for me is still, okay, with that data, okay, you know, who 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 get what, when, and how? Okay, you know, with that data, okay, you know, in data now is the social relations. Okay, and within the social relations, okay, you know, who get to control the data, who can modify the data, who continue to be in control of the data or not. Okay, and what are the story being told, okay, of, okay, the, the whole data, what, whatever. <laughs> Okay, in, 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 in this stage, and, uh, and, 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 and there are a lot of, okay, very, very intricate detail. And, um, and uh, if I may, okay, just, just, just give me half a second, I just leave the... In the lockdown, okay, I got nothing better to do, all right? And then I work out how, how do they do data capitalism and how do they commodify the data? What are, okay, the protocol, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, now those are, those are really beyond what I can manage, okay? Because it actually get into the technical realm, but I'm trying, okay? Exactly is trying to get at, okay? Some of the cross, and that is, some some of the some of the, the the center of things, okay, and 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 that is in reaction to I think earlier on a question by Adrian, okay, you know, I'm at the moment unable to answer your question, but doesn't mean that I'm not trying, okay, because this is this is you know really you know the 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 the, the, the technical side is actually just a little bit beyond what I can. To be honest, managed. So this is, if you like, an interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary project to be able to get at the the the, the counter hegemony. If I'm still answering Adrian's question, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I don't know whether I'm answering your question. You. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> I believe we have another question, maybe a final one, because we have the jury lab ahead. So, Carolina, please. Professor, thank you so much for such yeah. an inspiring conference. Uh, well, thank I you. work at the... Thank you. Thank you so much. I work at the economics, economics department, so I can see how performative this competitive narrative is in economic thought. <laughs> sorry. No, you're not sorry. Not at all. Now, your presentation made me think about the whole of legitimacy from institutions as World Economic Forum, considered as reference, as reference ones into discipline consciousness. So in your speech, you mentioned that watchers, then uh, you mentioned that watchers, then flexible translate means actors watch these narratives and then have some flexibility into translating. But it made me wonder if we could say that this flexibility is somehow variable among countries, mainly if we consider the stage of economic development. So considering the participation of world political and economic elites discussing so many sensitive topics, could we consider that some countries, mainly underdeveloped ones, are more constrained to follow these narratives? Or in other words, could we say that underdeveloped countries suffer more pressure to adopt these guidelines than developed ones, for example? Yes, I'm completely with you. I, I am completely with you because at the same time, I work on uh, developing countries as well. 
But anyway, uh, can I try to answer your question on two levels? The first level is on a theoretical level. <laughs> At the end of my talk, I just want to emphasize these are, okay, of course, there's a flexibility in it. Okay, no, 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 that you follow 100%. There's a flexibility in it. And this is just a shorthand of saying something, again, I'm sorry, in our book, okay, <laughs> that we have, we have talked about. Uh, in our book, we, we actually have uh, other concepts. And one of them, or one set of them is structural selectivity, a genteel selectivity, discursive selectivity, and technological selectivity. Just now, from my point of view, you're talking about maybe the structural selectivity. If I am within the world system, my country is located within whatnot, I'm number 45, okay, on the competitiveness, <laughs> on the competitiveness index, or even lower. Okay, the sort of pressure that policymaker or advisor, okay, or even economic department people, okay, would be under. Okay, so there is obviously a structural selectivity, okay, the structure itself select how flexible you can be or not. A genteel selectivity, the agency can select. In other words, if I happen, or if somebody else happened to be the director of a particular institute, as opposed to being another director, if that person is slightly more tuned to the more critical literature, do you see what I'm trying to say? There might be just that little bit of a genteel selectivity. But of course, we can't depend on those things. <laughs> okay. And of course, discursive selectivity. The discourse itself, see that. In my talk, I give the example of purgatory versus lighthouse. Okay, that is that is discursive selectivity. You'd see like a discourse, okay, that enable you, all right, to profile this difference so that make the other side just a little bit nervous about where they are. Okay, so. As an alternative, talking about alternative, may I refer to Adrian again? Okay, as an alternative, we can think beyond that discursive selectivity box. That discursive selectivity box, okay, we don't necessarily have to, okay, buy into this purgatory versus, you know what I'm saying, versus lighthouse, okay? You know, we could, okay, come up with slightly alternative way of thinking about it you know, in terms of a new kind of discourse, okay, you know, in some sense. So, but this kind of new new discourse, okay, to combine it with Gramsci will be a more trying to be a little bit more counter hegemonic as opposed to, okay, you know, sort of a hundred percent, you know, go with it, you know, sort of thing. So I completely share your, your view, you know, completely. It, it's just that in our work, okay, you know, we, 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 we got, another set of tools, okay, to analyze, all right, you know, this sort of thing, you know, and that is the structural selectivity, the agential selectivity, the discursive selectivity, and the technological selectivity. The technological is a Foucauldian technique, you know, in other words, okay, do you have to use seduction, okay, the technology of seduction, okay, what if, you know, you, you start to think that this is only seduction, come on, okay, it doesn't work like this, okay, then, then, then the whole thing starts to flop a bit, you know, you know, if you've been watching TikTok for too long, then you still think, oh my God, it's those little girl dancing again, you know, <laughs> well, anyway, you know, I, I don't know whether I'm communicating, but anyway. You know. Perfect. Thank you. It made me even more anxious to read your book. Thank you again. Oh, well, if you haven't got it, then just send me an email and I'll send you, send you one. I will. I will. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. It was a very nice debate here now. Nice exchange of ideas. Uh, I'm obliged to, to end it, unfortunately. Because <laughs> the, 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 the theory we have now ahead. Uh, professor, you are of course invited to participate in the discussion of the lab, the lab ahead, but don't feel uh, obliged to do it. Just yeah, yes, thank you, thank you. Well, thank you for the invitation. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and uh, and all the best for your conference. Okay, and uh, yeah, keep in touch. <laughs>
Keep in touch for sure. It was very nice to have you here with us. Uh, I, I, I truly believe that it was very inspirational for young scholars.